Amen, amen. How many of you are grateful? How many of you are thankful? How many of you want to praise the Lord for all that he's done for you? Truly, God is a good God. He's an on-time God. And he's an all-caring God. I told my wife this morning, I said, I feel good. I woke up, put my feet on solid ground, and I was happy. I was so excited, I slept good. How many of you slept good last night? You know, it's a blessing when you can sleep good. And I know that God was with me last night because I did not move. I rested well, and I'm thankful for what God has done. So that song is, is relevant to me. Amen. I just want to borrow a little bit of your time this, this afternoon. It's 12.15. I promise you I'll have you out of here no later than... No later then. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. So if you don't mind, I'm going to take my time. But I'll have you out of here in a good set amount of time. Amen. Amen. Let us have a word of prayer. Father God, we are so thankful that you have kept and carried us through this week. Lord, you have provided. You have protected. And you have proven yourself worthy of all praise, honor, and glory. And so it is to this end, Lord, that we come this afternoon, lifting up your name, Lord, and asking for your blessings to fall afresh upon us. Teach us, Lord, as we endeavor to engage in the study of your word. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. Amen, amen. Our scripture reading came from Genesis 41, verse 37 through 34. Let me see if I can pull that up again. You um, put that up on the screen for me, too. Genesis 41. It says, And the thing was good in the eyes of the Pharaoh and in, all the, and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one, such a one as this? is a man in whom the Spirit of God is. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. And thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled only in the throne will I be greater than thou. Briefly, for the next few minutes, I will conversate with you on the subject matter of the, from the pit to the throne. From the pit to the throne. Mm -hmm. I will give you three identifying factors that we will look at this afternoon, one being humble, the second being fidelity, and the third being integrity. Humble, fidelity, and integrity. Turn with me, if you would please, to the book of Genesis chapter 38. That's the book of Genesis chapter 38. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. In fact, you can skip down to probably around about... Let's go down to, I'm sorry, chapter 37, chapter 37. And let's go down to, to verse, I don't want to read the whole thing. Let's go down to verse 17. Joseph has just been sent out to find his brothers. You can follow along um, in your reading. But he went to find his brother, and as he was traveling to find his brothers, he had gotten to the land where they were supposed to be and found that they were not there. And so in his search, he was looking around, and there was a man that he came in contact with, and he inquired of this man, 
have you seen my brothers? And his, this man informed them him, that his brothers had traveled to the land of Dothan. To the land of Dothan. And so he decided that he would go on as he continued to find his brothers. And so when they saw him afar off, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to slay him. Now, why would Joseph's brothers decide and conspire against him? Joseph was a brother that was loved of his father. How many of you have ever heard of, have ever known that there is some times when love can be detrimental to one's soul as well as to one's salvation? In this beginning of Joseph, Joseph was a young man who was full of the Spirit of God. Blessed of God, he was the firstborn of Rachel, Jacob's wife. And he was one who was loved because this is the one in whom she, he desired. And because of his love for him, he instilled everything into him. Not that he didn't instill it into his brothers as well. But he showed a little bit more favor unto Joseph. And so as his brothers looked upon what was transpiring with their father and Joseph, they became jealous. And as they continued to watch and learn, they became even more envious of Joseph in their relationship with his father. And so this thing became a nuisance in the family. And the family began to become dysfunctional. And so as the brothers were looking at Joseph, they began to feel unequal to him. And so one day, a coat was made for Joseph. How many of you have ever had a special coat made for you? This is a warning not just to myself, but this is a warning to parents alike. When you are endeavoring to raise children, we must be considerate of each child. We must love each child equally. And we must not show bias. Even if in our hearts, we feel it. We must find a way to squash it. For in this situation, as Jacob has given this coat of many colors unto Joseph, Joseph is excited, he's happy, and as any child would do, he's showing off his coat. And his brothers are becoming even angrier and more angry and even angrier yet. And so at this point of the story, as Joseph has been sent out to Dothan to find his brothers, they see him, and the anger has manifested itself to the greatest heights that it could be. And so they conspired to slay their brother initially. And my heart dropped when I thought about this. That these brothers, though they were not of the same mother, they were still brothers indeed. Amen? Amen? And yet they conspired to slay their brothers. It says, and they said one to another, Behold, the dreamer cometh. Joseph was also noted for his dreams. And he dreamed on several occasions various different uh, dreams, one in which where he found his brothers kneeling to him, and that angered them. Another in which he found his brothers and his parents kneeling to him, even to the point where it bothered Jacob. But 
Jacob still overlooked it. But this angered their brother, his brothers. And so they said, here cometh the, drum, the dreamer. And it says, come now, therefore, verse 20, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say, some evil beast has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. Provoke not your child to anger. These boys... 10 decided that they were going to take their brother's life. But praise God, there's always one. There's always one. And Reuben stood out. And he said, no, let's not slay him. But let's just toss him into a pit. And leave him. And as the brothers conspired a little longer, they acknowledged what Reuben had said, and they said, okay, we will do this. And so they tossed him in the pit as Reuben went about his way. But deep down in Reuben's heart, he had desired to come back and save his brother. Thank God for the Holy Spirit, because it was nothing more than the Holy Spirit that impressed Reuben to desire to even save his brother's life. And so the story goes, as you will continue to read, that a caravan was coming by. And as the brothers saw the caravan, they thought unto themselves one more time, well, what's greater than slaying our brother than to sell him into slavery? And so as the caravan came by, they snatched their brother out of the pit and they get, sold him into slavery. Reuben came back, and he was looking for his brother. But as he came back, he found not his brother. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he may, not, that he may rid him him out of their hands to deliver him to his father. But when he came back, he was not. The Bible says that Reuben ripped his clothes. He says, how can I tell my father? But they still conspired to even lie unto their father, to kill an animal and to, do to take his robe and to put it into blood and to take it to their father. And to say he is no more. But this was a turning point for even Joseph. For Joseph, even in his innocence, was also guilty of being selfish and having his way. He had become comfortable with knowing that no matter what occurred, his daddy would always be there to pull him out. But this time, daddy was nowhere to be found. And so as Joseph is being pulled into this caravan, sold as a slave, he's going back into the land of the Egyptians. And as he's being taken, he looks over and he can see where his dad's tents lay. And for a brief moment, Joseph finds his heart burdened and his mind being taken away from the God that he has well been taught about. And so now he's in pain, he's hurting, he's mad, he's upset, but only for a brief moment. But the scripture has told us that if we train up a child in the way he should go, it should not depart from him. And as Joseph goes by, he determines in his heart, Lord, I will follow you. Turn with me, if you please, to 
2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and first, verse 14. The first point is how Joseph became humbled. 2 Samuel chapter 7. I mean, 2 Chronicles, I'm sorry, chapter 7 and verse 14. And it says, if, if is a conjunction, meaning that behind it something must transpire. If, my people, meaning that you are identified and verified as belonging to this God. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray. It was at this moment that Joseph realized all of the discrepancies that has happened and transpired between he and his brothers. And he had a humble spirit. And he began to pray. And he began to seek the face of the Lord. Not only did he seek it, but he said, I will not return to my wicked ways. Then it says, will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. It's an interesting thought to know that if we would just hear God and turn from our wicked ways, seek him and pray. Humble ourselves. You know, it's a sad thing when God has to humble you. But it's a better thing when you are led by the Spirit to be humbled of yourself. And so, at this point, Joseph began the transformation of that young boy who was all dependent upon daddy. And now he was becoming a man. A man of humble spirit. Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 15. Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 15. It should be on the screen. Say amen if you have it. If you don't, say hold on. But it says, for thus saith the Lord, saith the high and lofty one, that inhabited eternity, whose name is Holy, I dwell in the high and holy place. With him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. To revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. That gives me courage. It gives me hope to know that no matter where I think I am, God can reach down to the depths of my heart and revive me and allow me to have a humble spirit and be pulled back into his presence. Philippians 2.8. Philippians 2.8. It says, and being found in a fashion as a man, he was humble or he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So if it's good enough for our Lord and Savior, certainly it must be good enough for you and I. God says he's looking for humble men, women, boys, and girls. And so it is at this point that Joseph is now in the presence of his father. Realizing that I am, I'm in this battle. I have to go through this trial. I have to deal with this tribulation. But I will deal with it with a humble spirit. 1 Peter 5, 6 says. 1 Peter 5, 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, unto the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. In due time, sometimes we're just not ready. But praise God, the Holy Spirit is always prompting us, leading us, 
in guiding us into all truths. And when the time is right, God says, humble yourselves. Therefore, unto the mighty hand of God. And he will exalt you. How many are thankful for God who is always on your battle, always with you in the battle? Joseph, interesting enough, had been taught by Jacob and had been instructed on how to conduct oneself. He had been told about the process and the progress that God had done for both he, his father, and even his great-grandfather. Joseph had been told about what faith was about, fidelity. And so in his instructions, learning about how to be humble, and guess what? All of this transpired in one day. In one day, while he was traveling from the pit to the land of slavery. Joseph had learned about being humble, and now he had to be reflected back on what fidelity was. Turn with me, if you would, to Romans 10. And verse 17, Romans 10 and verse 17. It says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Joseph at this time has determined in his heart that no matter what comes about, he's going to be faithful and he's going to show forth God's spirit in this place of slavery. And so as, Joseph, as the story goes, if you jump over to chapter 39, you'll find where Joseph is reaching his destination and he's being sold and he's being given unto Potiphar. And Joseph has already determined that I am going to be the best slave that I can be. I'm going to be faithful and just. I'm going to do all according to the word of God. And so as he comes before Potiphar, he's in slavery, in a world that he's never been into before, growing up to become a man. He was only 17 years old, tossed in such a situation. But as he's tossed into this place, he begins to serve. And he begins to serve with such power, such faith, such humbleness that Potiphar is looking at him. And he is amazed at what he sees. But the one thing that struck me the most is Joseph never turned from his religious beliefs. He was steadfast and unmovable. That's a message for you and I. No matter what situation, no matter where you are in life, be steadfast and unmovable for your Lord and Savior. And so as he was conducting his business, Potiphar noticed him. And he said unto this young man, I am going to make you the ruler over all my house. That's powerful. He's a slave. Not only is he just a slave, but he's a Hebrew slave. And he's going to be over Potiphar's house. I don't know if you got that. You are a slave in the man's house, and his, his servants are expected to abide by what you say. That's power. That's power. But that comes from being a person of fidelity, one of faith. And so, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, if you would turn with me there. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, one of my favorite texts, says, But without faith, without what? It is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must what? And that he is a? that diligently seek him on his way into the slave camp. 
Joseph had determined in his heart, Lord, I'm going to follow you, come what may. My faith will not waver. I will stand fast. And quite frankly, he wasn't even looking for the reward. He was just wanting to represent his father. But the, but the lesson says that he would be a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. But here's the greatest point of all. We're all striving to make heaven our home. Amen? But the only way we can make heaven our home is to exhibit this spirit of fidelity. God said it is impossible to please me without it. You have to have faith. He says he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And so as he continued on, if you will turn on over to chapter 12 of Hebrews, chapter 12 and verse 2. How many of you know it's a wonderful thing to realize that you're not in this battle by yourself? Amen. How many of you would love to have Jesus on your side? Amen. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Let me say that again. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. In other words, guess what? You can't bring it up yourself. You got to have an author who's capable of writing the script for you. He's the author, but then not only that, he says that he will finish it for you. He's willing to walk with you, to lift you up, to carry you, to be your stronghold. He is the author and finisher of your faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. How many of you know that Jesus was thrown into a pit called earth? He left heaven for you and I. And he traveled in this pit for 33 and a half years, even to the cross. But thank God he rose and he sits on the throne. From the pit to the throne. From the pit to the throne. I am so elated and excited to know that we have a Savior who's still on the battlefield. Joseph has now learned about being humble. He has learned about fidelity, but now he must establish integrity. And so as he is going about his business, serving in Potiphar's house, doing all that he is supposed to be, there are, there's always someone or something that gets in the way. In this situation, it was Potiphar's wife. And you know the story. She came out to that young brother. And some say that Joseph was, wasn't just not any young brother, but that Joseph was a handsome young man. You know, Joseph was one of them brothers that stand up and women just like, oh, see? Yeah, yeah. And so, of course, her being the queen, she figured, well, I can have anything and everything that I want. And so she looked at Joseph, and she desired Joseph. And this didn't just happen one at a time. You know, this happened continuously until one day she found him in her place alone. And at this point in time, she desired, she said, you know what? I'm going to have me some Joseph. And I can imagine Joseph, young brother, you know, handsome, fit, Queen, you know the queen was beautiful. Young guy now. Come on, say amen. Some of us men have been teenagers before. I know you don't want to talk about it, but sometimes there's some women that's just so beautiful, and even though you may not want to, you'd be like, hmm. And she's coming on to him. And Joseph now literally has to make a conscious decision. You know. You know, I'm not a Beyonce fan, so she doesn't jump. I'm a Holly Berry fan, so, you know. But 
he had to make a decision. He's like, uh, but you know, the thing about Joseph was so powerful. His integrity was so high. Remember when Pastor um, uh, um, Bernard was here? And he, what did he say about the mind? He said, the mind is moving so quickly that a decision is already being made before you can spit it out. So whatever you spit out is what you really meant to say anyway. And so Joseph, he had to make a conscious decision, and his decision was not, he didn't even speak a word. He just said, I got to go. But before he went, he came out of his coat, and he left it behind. Actually, he spoke a word prior to leaving. He did speak a word prior to leaving. He said, how can I do this evil against my God? You know, but he got up out of there. He got out of there. And so he, he showed his step. Well, let, let's look at it. First, First Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58, and I believe 59. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50. It says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye. Always abounding in the work of who? Let's stop right there. Joseph was in a situation where he had to be steadfast and unmovable. But not only was he steadfast and unmovable, but his mind was stayed on God. Jesus said, or the word says, that if you keep your mind stayed on me, I will keep you in perfect peace. And so he was steadfast and unmovable, abounding in the work of the Lord. He, even in this situation, he was still working for the Lord. It says, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now that took some real powerful strength and integrity for that young brother to come out of that coat. Philippians 4.8, though. Philippians 4.8. It says, therefore, it says, finally, my brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are, whatsoever things are, whatsoever things are, whatsoever things are, there, if there be any, and if there be any, think on these things. I think Joseph's mind was focused on Christ. Even in the midst of the, all the degradation that was before him and about him, he still focused on God. And I call that integrity. But even beyond that coming out of his coat, Potiphar had to come in. His wife screamed bloody murder. She lied on that poor boy. How many of us has been lied on before? How many young men and women are in jail because they've been lied on before? Joseph was tossed into the dungeon. Tossed into the dungeon. Psalms 105 in verse 18 and 19 says that whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron until the time that his word came. The word of the Lord tried him. It says that Joseph was shackled, chained up, thrown into the dungeon. But even at that point in time, it says that his word came. The word of the Lord tried him. All of this time, Joseph is going through it, but he's never wavering. He's steadfast and unmovable. And while he is yet in prison, his fidelity and his humbleness stands fast. Guess what Joseph did while he was in the dungeon? He became a witness. That's right, he became a witness. What are we called to do? We are called to be witnesses, to spread this gospel. Praise God, we're not thrown into a dungeon. 
But we have the freedom to go outside the doors and spread this gospel. On next week, what are we doing? Outreach. Just a little plug. Come on back next week and be a part of what Joseph has learned to do, to be humble, have integrity and fidelity. So here he is. He's a witness. And while he's there, once again, because of his character, the captain of the guard notices him and puts him in charge of all the prisoners. That's powerful. But even doing that, his mission is still not yet complete. There comes a time when two servants are tossed into the dungeon with him. You know the story. One was the cupbearer and one was the baker, right? And they had both had dreams. How many remember what the dreams were? Amen. I'm glad you don't. You asked me to tell you. The cupbearer, he had a dream. And in his dream, he had this, this, oh, my goodness. Now the enemy's trying to get me. Let's go to the story. Genesis chapter, 40, chapter 39. Or 40, I'm sorry. Chapter 40. And Pharaoh's cup, and they dreamed both had a dream. Okay, here we go. And Joseph came unto them in the morning and looked, I'm at verse 6, upon them. And behold, they were sad and asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the ward of his Lord's house, saying, Wherefore look ye so sadly today? And they said to him, We have a dream, we have dreamed a dream. And there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, do not, in catch this now. Remember I said he was humble, he had fidelity, and he had integrity. Notice what he says, no interpreter. He says, let me go back to it. He says, do not interpretations belong to God. Tell me them, and I pray you. And so he gave his ownership to who it belongs. He gave it to God. Amen. He was still humble. He still showed faith because guess what? He already said, I know God's going to answer the prayer. But not only that, he showed integrity. And so, the, so they began to tell, the, tell their dream. Let's start at verse 9. And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream, behold, a vine was before me. And in the vine were three, how many? Three branches. And it was as though it budded, and her blossom shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. What kind of grapes? Good grapes, ripe grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. Amen. How many branches? Those three branches represented three days. Joseph told me, he said, in three days, you will be called upon from Pharaoh, and you will be saved, and you will be put back into your position. He said, but when you do, remember me. Remember me. Now let's go to the next one. So yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head, and we did that. But think on me when it shall come. We did that. For indeed I was stolen away out of the land of Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing. They should put me into the dungeon. And when the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said unto Joseph, I also had a dream. Behold, I had three white baskets on my head. And in the uppermost basket there was, all, there was of all manner of baked meats for Pharaoh. And the birds did eat them out of the basket upon my head. Hmm. How many? Three baskets. And, you know, sometimes it's, it's hard when you have to give bad news. Amen? But because Joseph was a man of integrity, he stood firm and he told the man what was going to transpire. He said, in three days, your head will be lifted and your body will be placed upon the pole and the birds will eat your flesh. Oh. And the birds will eat your flesh. And it happened 
just as Joseph had sold. So let's jump forward so we can, because I promise you, you will be out of here. And so, <laughs> and so by the time two years had passed, and Joseph was still in prison, but Pharaoh had a dream during this time. And Pharaoh's dream shook him. It startled him. He didn't know what to do or what to think. And so he called his magicians. He called all his servants. He called everybody he could to help him. Please tell me what this dream means. And they said, well, if you just tell us the dream, he told them the dream. They still couldn't tell him. And so finally it pained in, in the cupbearer's mind. He said, oh, I remember someone when I was in the dungeon. And he told my dream. And, and, and by the way, everything he said happened just as he said. And so Pharaoh got a little, you know, he, he, he wanted to know his dream. But you got to remember, Joseph was a Hebrew boy. Pharaoh was an Egyptian king. And so for him to have to disgrace his magicians and all of his people, but he wanted to know what the dream meant. And so he, he called forth for Joseph. And he asked him to bring him to him. And I, know, I, I love this part. Notice what Joseph, when he brings him to him. And Pharaoh, <clears throat> let's, let's go up to verse, um, we're going to read what, what the dream was first, and then we'll get down to what Joseph said. Verse 25, and Joseph said unto Pharaoh, the dream of Pharaoh is one. How many? Let me back up and let you know what the dream was. Joseph dreamed of stalks coming up, okay? Y'all remember that? Or do I need to go through it? The ears coming up, y'all remember that? All right, so y'all remember. So let's jump on down. And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, the dream, because he had two dreams, the dream of Pharaoh is one. God has showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good kind, kind or cows, Amen. The seven good kind are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years also. And so the dream is one and the same. Now, it said that the seven kind, the little skinny ones, came and ate up the other seven. They were fat and healthy, right? And after they ate them up, they were still what? Skinny. So that was kind of disturbing. But he said... And the seven thin and ill-favored kind that came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty years blasted with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. So now what Joseph has just explained to Pharaoh is you're going to have seven good years of harvest. You're going to have seven years of famine. Seven years. And, and, and so Pharaoh's like, man, what am I going to do? Now notice, Joseph is so humble Let's think about it. Joseph's got all the answers now. He's had his dreams, you know, so he could use this to his advantage. But notice what he did. Joseph goes on. He says, let Pharaoh do this. Let him appoint, verse 34, I'm sorry. Let him appoint officers over the land and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous seasons or years. So Joseph is telling him, what to do. Notice what has happened with Joseph over the years. Joseph has become a powerful administrator. He is a businessman. He knows how to run things. He has capitalized on everything that has God has given him. He is prosperous and he is blessed. But notice he says, Pharaoh, find you a man. And he said, and let them gather all the food of those good years that come and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh and let them keep the food in the cities. And that food shall be for store to the land against the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt. That land perish not through the famine. And the thing was good in the eye of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And so here's where it gets good. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this? Is a man in whom the Spirit of God is. Who did he say? 
in the spirit of God. Here you have this heathen king who has now recognized because of this humble, integrity, fidelity young man that God is. And even to the point that he is willing to now say, and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, verse 40, verse 40, uh, 39. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, for as much as God has showed thee all this. Notice this. This heathen man is giving honor to our Father, Savior, God. For as much as God has showed thee all this, there is none. Now, wait a minute. Pharaoh got plenty of men working for him. And he's sitting here and saying there is none, that Joseph is the only one. There is none so discreet and what? Why? As thou art. Verse 40. Thou shalt what? And according unto thy word shall all what? Only in the throne will I be what? From the pit to the throne. How many of you are ready to get out of this pit? that we live in. I'm ready to get out of this pit. And God has called us to be witnesses for him, no matter how detrimental that pit may seem. I'm going to read something to you from the inspired word of God. It blew my mind. It blew my mind. But I was excited to know that God is still a working God, even today. And while I'm reading that, that, that one, if you would put Job 28 and verse 28. It says, unto and unto man, he said, behold, the fear of the Lord that is wisdom and to depart from evil is understanding. What is that? The fear of the Lord that is wisdom, if you want wisdom, and to depart from evil is what? Understanding. Verse uh, 29. Or oh, is that it? That's it? Okay. Here's what the inspired word says. There are few who realize the influence. Technology, people. There are few who realize the influence of the little things. What things? The little things of life upon the development of the character. There are few who realize the little things upon the development of the character. Those little things that we should be doing are the things that will help us to grow and become wax strong truly in the word of God. Nothing with which we have to do is really small. The very circumstances that we meet day by day are designed to test our faithfulness and to qualify us for greater trust. By adherence to principle in the transactions of ordinary life, the mind becomes accustomed to hold the claims of duty above those of pleasure and inclination. What did I just say? Those little things. When we are focused on God, when our mind is so set, we begin to not allow the things of this world, those pleasurable things, to come in and interfere with our relationship with God. It says, minds thus disciplined are not wavering between right and wrong. Like the reed trembling in the wind, they are loyal to duty because they have trained themselves to habits of fidelity and truth. They have trained themselves to habits of fidelity and truth. Train up a child in the way in which he should go, and he shall not depart from it. didn't say that he might not falter, but it says that it would be there, and it will be able to revive him when the word comes in due season. 
Amen. By faithfulness, in that which is least, they acquire strength to be faithful in greater matters. An upright character is of greater worth than the gold of Ophir. That's the land in, in Egypt that is nothing but gold, rich, populous. That's how God wants us to be. Without it, none can rise to an honorable eminence, position. You want position? Get in the mindset of God. But character is not inherited. It cannot be bought. Moral excellence and fine mental qualities are not the result of accident. The most precious gifts are, are, are of no value unless they are improved. The formation of a noble character is the work of a lifetime and must be the result of diligent and persevering effort. God gives opportunities. Success depends upon the use made of them. I pray and hope that it is our desire to become as Joseph, humble, fidelity, and integrity. Let us be steadfast and unmovable. Let God reign in our hearts. And when I say hearts, our minds, as well as this heart. May God bless you. May God keep you. And may a spirit dwell with you. Amen.